Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Libby McNamee is an author, a lawyer, and a U.S. Army veteran. Her second novel, Dolly Madison and the War of 1812, was published on the 207th anniversary of the burning of Washington City. Her first novel, Susanna's Midnight Ride, The Girl Who Won the Revolutionary War, was named number one in juvenile fiction by the Independent Publishers Awards, Pinnacle Book Awards, and she was a finalist in historical fiction. The Virginia General Assembly created Susanna Bowling Day in honor of that girl who won the Revolutionary War based on Libby's research. A native of Boston, Libby graduated from Georgetown University, Catholic University Law School, and she also served in the US Army as a JAG officer in Korea, Bosnia, Germany, and Washington State. Libby lives in Washington DC area, in the Richmond area actually, with her patient husband, her high school son who loves history, and she joins me today from Richmond. Welcome, Libby. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely intro, Grace. I'm honored to be here. Well, I'm so happy to have you, and thank you for your service in the Army. So how did all that amazing lawyering around the world turn into becoming a novelist? That is a um, wonderful question. Um, I've always loved to write ever since I was little. always loved to read. My sister and I used to go and get uh, a stack of books out of the library once a week. We'd walk over there and then a week later we'd go back with our, get a new stack. So I've always liked to write. And when I went to law school, part of the reason was because I wanted to write. And then I realized it wasn't really the type of writing that I wanted to do. It's not creative and all of that. So I did a lot of exploring. I did a lot of, I wrote a lot of travel articles when my son was younger and realized that I had an interest in history that I never realized that I had before. So it it basically was just a, a, such a long progression that got me where I am today. And I'm so glad you got there because I have to personally thank you. Historical fiction used to be my go-to and then other genres for whatever reason came into my life. And when I saw your books, you reawakened my love of historical fiction. And I, I love that you did that for me personally. And I'm sure that you do that particularly for young adults because that's your focus. Why did you pick the young adult market? Well, originally I picked the young adult market because the story of Susanna Bowling basically was going to be a young adult book because she was 16 years old. So I was told that because of her age, that's what it needed to be. So I got into that genre and um, for that reason, but also part of me is I wish that I had discovered my love of history when I was younger, like when I was in middle school. And so part of it is trying to ignite that interest in, in um, middle school, especially girls, so that that's a, basically a hobby or an interest they can pursue their entire life and not discover it in their 40s like me. Well, I love that you pick kind of a special niche, too. It's not just historical fiction. It's, and I'm not sure if this is even a real genre, it's patriotic. Mm -hmm. It's American history. And did your military background influence that in any way? I think that being in the Army definitely made me more patriotic and um, respectful and appreciative of being an American. Um, but it's kind of neat how we, the stories have kind of, I feel like they sort of fell on my lap. The Susanna's Midnight Ride, I was at a funeral and I ended up talking to someone I had never met. It was actually an uncle of this 14-year-old girl who had passed away. And he said, I heard you're a writer. I've got this story and I think you're the one to write it. And I thought, why me? And I, I, you know, so when he told me the story about what Susanna Bowling had done, I thought, there's no way that this girl did this. And it's true because why wouldn't it be in the history books? So I started to research it more to disprove it to myself. And the more I researched, the more I was like, dang, this is true. And then I really fell in love with history. And since I grew up in Boston, I always heard about Lexington and Concord. And I knew about Yorktown, but I really hadn't paid much attention to the whole Southern theater of the war. So that was really neat. Explore, finding out about that 
and living in Richmond and being able to go to all these different locations and met all sorts of reenactors and visit all sorts of museums. And so it was, it was neat to find a story that was located here. So tell our listeners a little bit about Susanna, because now she has a day named after her, and that's what you did. Um, she was a 16-year-old girl from a very wealthy family in the Petersburg area of Virginia. And her brothers, three brothers were off fighting in the Revolutionary War as patriots. Her father had passed away. And most of the action was going on either up in New York City area with where General Washington was, or uh, General Cornwallis was coming up through the South and he was in North Carolina. And lo and behold, out of the blue, all of a sudden General Cornwallis showed up with his entire British Southern Army, walking down her lane to quarter at her family's house overnight. And that night she overheard him talking, assuming that you know she was a silly little girl and he was talking about their plans to capture Lafayette the next morning. So she ended up sneaking out of her house in the middle of the night through a secret underground tunnel that was originally built to prevent, uh, to hide from Indian attacks. And it led out to their dock on the river. And then she canoed across the Appomattox River alone in the dark, grabbed a neighbor's horse and rode 10 miles in the dark to warn Lafayette and as I started to research, I realized, oh, my gosh, she would have had to make her way home because there, that was the one road that connected the north and the south back then. It was an old Indian trail. So you know, she couldn't exactly say when they ran into her at eight in the morning of like, hey, I just was on a target run. So she I realized, oh, my gosh, not only what an emotional feat, but a physical feat of going all that way in the pitch dark and making her way home before sunrise, before someone spotted her on that road. So um, I was just blown away by the story. And she has an, if, an interesting difference between her and Paul Revere, who many of us, who all of us as Americans know about. What's the difference? Paul Revere got caught, which nobody really talks about. And I grew up in Boston, so I heard all about Paul Revere all the time. Paul Revere here, Paul Revere there. And um, even here, when I started to research the story, there were some people in the Petersburg area who said that they had heard the story. And a couple of people even said it was a bedtime story for them. But as they grew up, they forgot about it. And it really never got recorded. So, and I think part of it is, well, it's up, open to conjecture of why the story didn't get out. And it really, it could be the fact that she came from a wealthy family. And back then, what she did was frowned upon for girls to be acting so boldly that maybe they didn't want it to become public knowledge. But that was kind of neat because that was one of sort of the, what I call the black holes that I had to fill in the story. That's what I love about historical fiction is you kind of get, you get your built in plot, but then you've got all these black holes that you get to fill in based on all your research of thinking, what's a, what's a logical explanation for this black hole here? So. Absolutely. And so fast forward 30 years and now we're in 1812 and we have Dolly Madison and I have the privilege of reading both of your books. Tell us about Dolly Madison because I have to tell you, I had no idea how influential she was, not only in history, but in society. Mm -hmm. And also, I love, if you can even talk about the difference in women's roles in those mm -hmm. 30 years between Susanna and uh, Dolly. Well, at, what's funny is Dolly and Susanna were only about three years apart in age. And because Susanna was 16 when the Revolutionary War ended and Dolly was only 13 years old, but basically her time came later. So that was really kind of an amazing thing to realize that they were, you know, basically very close to the same age. And really the role of women hadn't changed much at all in that space of 30 years. I mean, it really is amazing when you realize like women weren't invited to parties. They weren't invited to dinner parties. They you know, they were completely excluded. They weren't, they didn't even observe, they weren't even watching Congress. So the fact that Dolly would march in there with all of her friends was just like shocking to everyone and that she really had an interest and in, that she had an opinion. And, um, and I'm totally with you because that was another one where um, I actually went to a lecture with my friend Jada Justice and um, we have birthdays that are just a day apart. So we try to do something together. And she said, oh, there's a lecture on Dolly Madison at the um, Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And I thought, all right, it's her birthday, I'll go. And I'm like, oh, I don't really wanna hear about this hostess with the mostess. And then by the end of it, I was like, there's my second book. Oh my gosh. I mean, the stories of her, you know, 
with the uh, sleeping with the Tunisian saber under uh, or sword underneath her uh, bed at night when the British were approaching and and her boldness because the speaker was the CEO from Montpelier Plantation and she was amazing. So I was just sold of once again of it's just funny how women are portrayed a certain way in history and it isn't always the truth. So it was it was kind of neat to rediscover Dolly and really research the times. And there was a book that I used a lot. It was called Parlor Politics. And that's what that's what Dolly used was parlor politics and her charm offensive is called, historians call it. Um, but her shrewdness is just amazing about how she did everything, accomplished what she wanted to, but she did it with such kindness that people didn't realize that she was so smart and that she really did have an end goal in mind. So, I mean, just absolute, a political genius of her time. And working within the confines, within these very strict constraints of what women were allowed to do. And she had a very, like, um, uh, I don't know, um, I, um, willing husband, you know, to kind of go along with her schemes. So <laughs> that definitely helped. Well, they were very much partners despite their huge differences, mm -hmm. correct? Right. Yeah. She was 17 years younger than him. She was about four inches taller than him, outweighed him by quite a bit. And they were just absolute introverts. She was the quintessential extrovert. She loved people. She got her energy from socializing. He was the absolute opposite. He was a total introvert. He would rather stay home by a roaring fire with his Greek and, and uh, Latin books and read history. And they just adored each other. Like she always said, you know, our hearts understand each other. And um, what I like to point out to kids is this is a great example of a very healthy marriage where you look at your mate or your spouse as saying, as look at what wonderful qualities they bring to the relationship into the world instead of saying, well, I wish you were more like me or I wish you would do this. I wish you would do that. So I just I love their their love story and how they really did not like to be apart. There were very few times that they were apart. So there really aren't that many letters between the two of them because they really did not like to be apart if they didn't absolutely have to be. So. Well, I love that you focus on young adults for several reasons. One is the story is so, as you tell your story, the characters are so relatable. How do you make that happen? Because I feel that, you know, Dolly Madison, we all have that image of her usually in a turban and she looks very high society, but I feel I could sit down with Dolly in a second and Susanna and her mother and the other characters. How do you make that so relatable in your stories? That's, I mean, that's where the real work comes in. Of, but what I try to do is I do research to the point where I'm finding like joy in the story. And I try to really communicate that joy of like, I have so much respect for Dolly. I have so much respect for Susanna. And I want to basically show what they were going through. And that's why I like to write in the first person. And I like to write in present tense because it even for me, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I have to re I have to research the War of 1812. This is going to be a snoozer. So I want people to feel like they're experiencing it with her of uh, going through it and thinking, oh my gosh, what is going to happen now? This is horrendous. Because that's what I felt like, you know, once you get past the, you know, the tomes and all that, but realizing like, these are just incredible stories. The burning of Washington City, the Battle of Baltimore, the miracle of New Orleans. I mean, it's they would make wonderful movies. So if anybody listening knows Steven Spielberg, I will definitely take his call on the first ring. Well, and I think that it is that relatable in the moment that you create, which makes it so magical. And I also love the reminders of history. And I'm not even sure if they're reminders for me as opposed to being new discoveries. I think you talked about in the Dolly book how the War of 1812 was really a second revolutionary war. Yes. We, we almost did not come out of it together as a United States. I know. I had no idea that we really almost lost our country. And I think it's part of our American pride that we don't like to think about it. We don't like to think about a foreign army marching down unopposed down Pennsylvania Avenue and burning our, you know, the president's house and the Capitol and all of that. So we just kind of pretend it didn't really happen. But it is it is amazing. And what I love is I find I tend to compartmentalize history. I kind of have I've got the Revolutionary War here and then I've got Civil War here. And 
you know, I had this huge gap and now it's kind of neat because back, you know, during the Revolutionary War, James Madison, James Monroe, they were like the young guys, you know, the teenagers kind of, you know, along for the ride. And now they're the old guys and Henry Clay is there and John Calhoun and uh, Daniel Webster. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe they knew each other. And, you know, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson knew James Madison. I mean, that shows you how little I knew when I started. Well, that's uh, amazing. And how much you know now, I'm always interested when I listen to you speak about the things that you still retain, because I can be in the moment and say, oh, I know this. But the fact that it might not stay there is very real. I loved how you captured the inauguration of Monroe, uh, I'm sorry, of Madison, when Thomas Jefferson is like, he can't wait to get out the door. He's done. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, I mean, it was amazing. He even showed up. Um, yeah, he was a character. And that's what I love to tell kids and show kids and, and, you know, adults too, of, you know, we look at these founding fathers as, you know, Jefferson, you know, we think of them that they, first of all, that they have to be perfect. And they were, they're, they were far from perfect, just like we are far from perfect. They are humans with flaws. And that's what I love is getting to the point where you have the funny stories about Jefferson answering the front door of the president's house, wearing his holes, his, his slippers with the holes in the toes, dressed like a farmer. And, you know, he had what he had uh, a couple of grizzly bears that Zebulon Pike gave him that were in cages outside. And he had sheep on there. And I actually found something. One of his sheep that he had roaming actually killed a two year old boy. Oh, no. And it, we never hear about that. Like we, you know. So how do you decide what stays in and what doesn't? And uh, what turn, just turns into another novel? Because my favorite part of your writing, in addition to making these characters come alive, are all of the factoids you bring us, like the sheep and the slippers. Yes. So how do you decide what goes in and what stays out? Well, a lot of it, sometimes I get to the point where some of these factoids, I'm like, this scene is a delivery device for this factoid. Like uh, I had read that during the Revolutionary War that these soldiers were writing letters home and they had a ration every day of vinegar to, you know, clean their water, but they were using it to get the smallpox off the letters because they figured out that smallpox be could be conveyed through a piece of paper. So I thought, I've got to have a letter here because I've got to mention the smell of vinegar when she opens the letter. So um, what I do is I start off with just, I do a lot of research I've got books open all over the place here and I kind of, you know, meander through them and take notes and I just basically keep it very simple, like a word document. And I just, I just take notes and, you know, um, quotes and that kind of thing and, and highlight them so I can, you know, make it easier to find them when I go back. But then I kind of, once I've got it all and I'm writing, I kind of just do a lot of like searching and cutting and pasting and putting all the factoids together. And then even as I'm writing the book at the bottom, I have all these factoids that I want to use. And then I'm kind of just, I keep combing through them and thinking, where can this fit? Where can I use this? And, and every once in a while, there's something that doesn't end up fitting. But most of the time, I, you know, by the time I'm totally done, I just have like a couple that are left there. So, um, so the, the vinegar factoid was important to you. The one that I loved was about Dolly Madison and the ice cream. Uh, and then in Susanna uh, and the Midnight Ride about the funeral cakes. So can yes, you share with our cake. listeners those two? Oh, the death cakes. Um, and, I, you know, that's what's funny is with all these history books, it, it I always tell kids doing research is look at at least three books because usually the truth is somewhere in between the three of them. And if you see it in three books, then, um, then it's, you know, you know, it's true. But usually each book has a little factoid that isn't in another one. So um, it is really um, fun to just, you know, find that little nugget. And I think, oh, gosh, I'm so glad I got that book because I learned that. So, um, so I'm trying to remember the factoid that you, you asked. The death, about. the death cakes and the ice cream. Okay, so the death cakes. I actually, that was just like an extraneous thing on, on some book I got on like the history of knitting in America, which I never, a book I never thought I'd be excited to get from Amazon. And they mentioned it in there. And then I kept searching and searching and searching. And I really couldn't find a whole lot of information, but I found enough. So um, I like those because those really create an aura in the story and it really transports the reader into this is a different time. Like this is how people find out that someone died. Someone came with a funeral notice wrapped up 
around a little caraway seed cake. And it's like, then you think, oh my gosh, all that ink is on their little muffin. <laughs> what are they thinking? Um, but yeah, I, I love those things because for me, it's just like, oh my gosh, the death cake, like, you know, and yeah. Um, oh, no. but yeah, it was, it was really hard to find. And what was Dolly's <laughs> most popular ice cream? No, it was guess. oyster, oyster ice cream, but she had like chestnut, asparagus, um, strawberry was, she unveiled that at the, um, at the second, uh, her husband's second inauguration. Um, Parmesan was another flavor. And back then they called it, um, what iced creams. And it was, in a, I mean, people loved it. Jefferson was the one who had brought it back from France when he was over there. But, um, in a lot of ways, it was kind of a display of wealth because they had no refrigeration and they had no way to freeze anything. So it's mind boggling that they would have these like ice cellars and then they would have like ice broken up from the river, like during the winter and they would have it like way down at the bottom and, you know, had all these ways to keep it cold. So it was like extremely expensive and labor intensive to have these iced, iced creams. And um, she just loved all this fine food. And, you know, she grew up basically poor. So I think that was kind of a celebration of, that was something just wonderful to her to have this abundance of food, but she really just had this contagious joy with people and celebrating life that was so wonderful. And, you know, this was back in the time of duels that Dolly had this, you know, opened up the president's house to everyone, which was unheard of. And she said, if you, if you treat people well, they will behave well. So she wanted to have all this fine food and she wanted to have the you know, the Navy band playing and, and all that. And, um, cause I, I can only, I, you know, in my mind, I think of James Madison being like, oh my gosh, like if there's a duel at our house during this <laughs> Wednesday night thing, I'm going to be the, you know, I'm going to be the laughing stock of the world. And her saying, don't worry, I got it. You know, and that if she saw people that were starting to bicker, she would just send over a lovely piece of cake and some whiskey punch and, um, and then she would always inquire about someone's, you know, how are your grandchildren? And I heard that your granddaughter wasn't well and inquire after people's mother. And, you know, just, I mean, we can all learn from Dolly of just don't go there. She was the quintessential um, hostess and she was the first person to ever be called first lady, which I also loved. Yes. I, I didn't realize that either. That was, I thought that was so neat at her funeral. Yeah. She was called first lady of the land. First, first lady. Our time is going so quickly. I oh, wanted to just ask you a couple of more things. One is how important is place? You live in such an amazing historical place. So how important is where you live to how you write? Oh, gosh. I think, I mean, I love a sense of place, especially in history, just because it grounds the story so much and brings it, you know, brings it to life of, of how they live. But um, that's a really good question. I never actually really thought about that. But a sense of place is very important to me. And a lot of it's too, is I try to incorporate the seven senses and I try to go through drafts and make sure that I've got a sense of smell. So like in Suzanne, it was springtime. So it was really fun to think of, well, what are the the scents of that we know in a Virginia springtime or, or even talking about the um, pollen that is just coats everything for a couple of weeks here. And um just all the, even, you know, cicadas that come and, and, and all that of, of just bringing, bringing this area to life. But um, it's just another way to add atmosphere to a story. I think of, of really, um, really trying to flesh out the setting as much as you possibly can in Washington city. I mean, there was so much to work with just because it was, it really was a swamp and it was, you know, muddy and, dusty and nothing was there. And I mean, it's just mine. I mean, you and I have both lived in Washington for a long time. It's amazing that there was it nothing there. It is. One of the things I know you love to do, and I want to make sure our listeners know this, is you love doing school visits, historical society visits, and you can do that in person or you can do that virtually. How can people find you doing that? Libby? Oh, gosh. Um, thank you so much, Grace. Um, well, my my website is LibbyMcNamee.com, and you can definitely contact me through there, and uh, Libby at Sagebrush Publishing. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram uh, at Libby McNamee author. So yes, I love talking to adults and to kids and getting people excited about history. So you can tell I get a little excited too. So 
<laughs> well, I, I love it. You know, I, I think that you inspire the future by learning the past. And I'm so excited that you were a storyteller with us today. Thanks so much, Libby. Oh, thank you. This was wonderful. I'm honored. I hope that when your next book comes out, you'll help educate me and come back to our storytellers. You bet. You're top of the list. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. This episode of The Storytellers is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network. Thanks so much for listening.